Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to From World War II to the Space Race, the story of Project Paperclip. My name is Sydney Yeager, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Now in its 25th year, the museum is committed to the crucial mission of educating our diverse community about Jewish life and heritage before, during, and after the Holocaust. As part of that mission, our programs illuminate the stories of survivors, broader histories of hate and anti-Semitism, stories of resistance against injustice, and more. Thank you for joining us today virtually. We hope you will visit the museum in person to see our new core exhibition, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do, alongside our temporary exhibitions, Boris Lurie, Nothing to Do But to Try, running through November 6th, and Survivors, Faces of Life After the Holocaust from photographer Martin Schuller, which opens on September 18th. You can learn more and find tickets at mjhnyc.org. We appreciate the vital support of our members so much here at the museum. And if you wanna get closer to the museum and enjoy exclusive programs, member previews to exhibitions and free admission, you can explore museum membership at mjhnyc.org slash membership um, or email membership at mjhnyc.org to learn more. Closed captions are available on today's program and instructions on how to turn captions on or off will be posted in the chat in addition to all the links I've mentioned. If you have questions for our speakers during the program, please put them in the Zoom Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the hour. Um, and though I'll be off camera during the talk, I'll be here in the chat if you have any questions or any issues. Today, we are honored to be joined by Dr. Michael Neufeld, Eric Lichtblau, and Linda Dawson. Michael is a senior curator in the Space History Department of the National Air and Space Museum, where he is responsible for the early rocket collection and for Mercury and Gemini spacecraft. He has written or edited nine books, notably The Rocket and the Reich, Von Braun, and Space Flight, A Concise History. In 2017, Secretary David Scorden gave him the Smithsonian Distinguished Scholar Award, the highest research award of the institution. Eric is a two-time Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and best-selling author of The Nazis Next Door, How America Became a Safe Haven for Hitler's Men, as well as Bush's Law, The Remaking of American Justice, and Return to the Reich, A Holocaust Refugee's Secret Mission to Defeat the Nazis. He is currently working on a book on the alarming surge in hate crimes and white supremacy, which will be published by Little Brown and Company next year. He was a Washington reporter for the New York Times for 15 years, reporting mainly on national security and law enforcement issues, and for the Los Angeles Times for 15 years before that. Linda is most recently a space historian, author of The Politics and Perils of Space Exploration and War in Space, and is currently writing her latest book focused on a personal perspective of women in air and space. She's an MIT graduate of aeronautics and astronautics, having worked as a flight controller for the space shuttle program and NASA's mission control. She's retired from the University of Washington as a senior lecturer emeritus. Thank you so much for joining us today. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Linda, Michael, and Eric. Thank you, Sydney. It's an honor for me to uh, moderate this discussion with our esteemed panelists. And um, I'll, I'll start by giving a brief overview and then we'll kind of go right into the questions. As World War II was drawing to a close, American and British organizations sought to gain access to German military scientific and technological research for military advantage. In a covert campaign originally dubbed Operation Overcast, but later renamed Operation Paperclip, hundreds of German scientists and technicians, along with their families, were brought to the United States to work on behalf of America in gaining military superiority during the Cold War. Operation Paperclip was a secret program of the Joint Intelligent Objectives Agency that occurred between 1945 and 1959. The operation brought more than 1,600 Nazi German scientists, engineers, and technicians most notably Werner von Braun and his V2 rocket researchers, plus their family members bringing total to over 6,000 Germans to the United States for government employment in order to gain a military and scientific advantage over the Soviet Union in the post-war world. Their cases were marked for special consideration by a paperclip in their file, hence the name paper, Operation Paperclip, the Soviet Union took their selection of German scientists as did the United Kingdom and France 
allied scientists were willing to overlook any crimes committed for the greater good. This meant that no matter what crimes they had committed as Nazis, their cases would be expedited as they were approved for admission to America. It's important to note that not all the immigrants chosen had Nazi connections and Michael has some more uh, specific information on that. Our discussion today will focus on three primary topics. The ethical decisions made in carrying out Operation Paperclip, the whitewashing of the associations that the scientists, technicians had with the Nazi party, and a look at the most famous, probably the most famous of all the German scientists, Werner von Braun, and his contribution to the success of the United States and to the space race. Let's start with the first question on ethics. Uh, the United States has conducted wartime activities in order to preserve national security. Some of these activities involve making ethical decisions where it was determined that the positive result outweighed the, the means taken. What were the ethical issues involved in the United States fully engaging in Operation Paperclip in the late 1940s? And if you could, please expand, exp, expand on the historical reference here and what was known about the individuals tagged for going to the United States. Maybe we'll start with Eric and then we'll go to Mike. Okay, thank you, Linda. Um, well, Project Paperclip was really a, a, a moral conundrum for the United States. Uh, it, it, was, um, it was believed by uh, the entire US Intelligence Committee, even before the end of the war, as they were planning for the post-war period, that this was going to be a, a technological race, what became the space race against the Russians, our allies ostensibly during the war. Um, but you had uh, the Russians who were quite aggressive in grabbing German scientists, sometimes literally kidnapping them. And the United States and Britain and France did not want to be left behind um, in, in that technological race. And uh, so the moral conundrum was how far are we willing to, to go to exploit the, the, the knowledge of the Germans um, who had just created these uh, technologically revolutionary V2 missiles that were that that rained down incredible damage on London and Antwerp and, and other places um, and were unlike anything that uh, the uh, that the allies that the United States in particular had had seen um, and, and and the moral complexity that I think is is borne out by the fact that officially at least these were not supposed to be quote unquote ardent Nazis uh, which became sort of a, a, a farcical term uh, but in the in the official approval at the highest levels at the War Department um, at, uh, onto the White House uh, they could not be ardent hardcore, Nazis, but in fact, many of them, many of them were, uh, and uh, their records were, were whitewashed. Um, you had, especially among the senior leadership of the Nazi scientists and engineers, people who were directly involved in, um, in war atrocities, in the use of slave labor, uh, in the use of, of medical experimentation. Three of the guys who ended up in Texas had actually been tried and acquitted somehow at Nuremberg for medical experimentation. So this was basically a, a, a situation where uh, the, the United States, over the protests of people at the State Department, by the way, uh, who, who protested this vehemently, um, believed that the, the benefits outweighed the, the obvious moral, um, uh, moral baggage that came with using people who had been involved in, in um, horrible war atrocities and the worst genocide in history. Thank you. Um, Michael, you have something to add? Well, I, you know, I did want to set the bigger context that Eric has somewhat alluded to, which is, of course, you know, um, this was a global phenomenon that involved the Soviets, the US, Britain, France, and ultimately Argentina and several other countries all tried to grab German science engineers. So that the, the end of the war, there was this kind of gold rush. Uh, it, the impression was left and it still remains fairly entrenched among some people that somehow the Germans were technologically superior to the US or to some of the other allies. And in fact, that's not the case. However, there were certain areas where their what they'd done seemed better and rocketry and notably like the V2 missile was a one obvious case of that. Uh, in many other cases, they were on a similar level of the allies, but 
the knowledge seemed to be valuable. So there was this attempt to bring in this hall of information and people, uh, documents, uh, and, 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 and tacit knowledge that the people brought with them about how to use the technology or how to build the technology. So, you know, as, you know, as Eric indicates, the problem was that, you know, you in some cases had to take some people or maybe we didn't have to, but we did take some people who were very useful for transferring that knowledge, but who had dubious or outright criminal records in their background. Um, I, you know, I want to underline when it comes to the whole project paperclip, it is problematic to have a blanket uh, assertion about them because the 1500 number cited is probably only the end of the 1950s and actually didn't stop in 59. It went on in the 1960s. And as you get later and later in time, these people, uh, scientists and engineers are often too young to even have been significantly involved in World War II. And so the record tends to shift over time. Uh, also, when it comes to the early, so I did one study, I had, a, I managed to find a sample of 90 records on the early in the Fun Brown group that went to El Paso and then to Huntsville. Um, about 50-50 in terms of membership and Nazi organization. So you get a real range here. You get some people were uh, low-level technicians, you get mid-level engineers, you get high-level scientists and engineers, uh, and their level of involvement in the Nazi system and in things that were criminal, like the exploitation of concentration camp labor or medical experiments, varies enormously. A lot of the people who came through this channel were nominal party members or not party members at all, and just because of the nature of their jobs, we're not actually involved in anything that could be described as truly criminal. The moral question was raised at the beginning of this whole program, particularly in the protests in the United States from liberal and Jewish groups in the middle of the mid, mid late 40s, sort of like around 47. <clears throat> Should we take anybody? Is it, you know, is taking anybody from the, any science engineer from the Third Reich by nature just ethically uh, unacceptable? Or is there some line where we declare these people are acceptable to us and these other people shouldn't be, or they should be on trial and not coming here? So, so yeah, it's it's complicated. Okay, thank you. To address the opposite point of view, if the United, United States hadn't accessed these Nazi scientists and technology, the Russians most likely would have, and then could have won the Cold War and the race to the moon. How do you respond to this? Do the ends justify the means in this case? And we'll start with Eric. Well, I, I think that was the mindset of, of many of those in, in the War Department um, in particular. I, I tell the story in my book um, that sort of encapsulates that idea in my view uh, of, of General Patton immediately after the war visiting with some of the Nazi scientists who were still at that point in a POW camps in, in Germany in sort of a VIP setup. And one of them was Walter Dronberger, who was the, the most senior head of the space, the missile program for, uh, for the Nazis. He was above Werner von Braun. Um, and Patton uh, asked if he was the guy in charge of the V2 program. And, and uh, Dronberger said, yeah, all head general. And Patton, this is according to one of the other Nazi scientists that I found in the archives, Patton actually gave him a cigar and said, well, congratulations, we couldn't have done it. Um, so that, that was the mindset um, of many, uh, especially on the military side. Now, as I alluded to, on the State Department side, you had a much different viewpoint. Um, and before this became public, relatively quickly, it was a secret operation for, oh, probably six months or a year when it started in America. But um, during the point where this was supposed to be a small program of perhaps two, three, four hundred people and it grew to 1600 people, the State Department was, was really kicking and screaming about, you can't be taking Nazi scientists and bringing them to America, even on a temporary basis. That's another point worth men mentioning is that these were supposed to be temporary visas to get to the United States. They didn't end up being temporary. Many of these guys lived out their lives in the United States. But when the State Department was protesting this still secret program, um, the, the, the War Department, there was one memo that I, that I found where they told them, you need to get with the program. And the quote was that, that, I, that stuck with me, you need to stop, stop kicking a dead Nazi. 
um, because the State Department realized that, uh, that both optically and morally, this was really a treacherous area that, that the United States was, was getting into. Now, the, the, the question you, um, you pointed out is, is a central one, certainly. Um, in all likelihood, did we get to the moon um, quicker because of Werner von Braun and Arthur Rudolph under him and Walter Dornberger and others? Yes, probably. Although, although as as Michael is saying, you know, they, they may not have been quite the geniuses that we make them out to be in hindsight. But um, uh, you know, there were certainly many, and I would put myself in this camp that that was not worth the the moral stain, really, that that um, that that created for the U.S. in in embracing people who had just been the enemy literally months earlier. Okay. Thank you. You know, I, I, I would argue with that. I mean, I, I don't want to come off as an apologist and certainly not for Rudolph and some of the others who were uh, shouldn't have been come, shouldn't been allowed to come here. But the in reality, uh, it was in the U.S. national interest to take some of these people, a lot of these people. Um, uh, it contributed to uh, the defense uh, capability of the U.S. I and mean, this had nothing to do with space at the beginning. I must underline there was no space program until like 10 years after World War II. This was about transferring uh, knowledge of guided missiles, radar, submarines, aircraft, jet, turbojet engines, so on and so on and so on. And uh, as I pointed out, there are a lot of people who came under this program who were ordinary engineers and scientists who had minimal or no Nazi records. So the, I have a problem with the, the, the kind of um, uh, uh, black and white, either we take them all or we don't take any of them uh, point of view. Uh, and um, I, I, you know, I don't think it does justice to the reality and to the historical complexity of this phenomenon. Um, uh, on the the question you asked, no, I don't think it, they made a huge difference to the United States one way or the other. Maybe, as Eric says, I've discussed probably accelerated going to the moon. I've been asked many times, would we have gotten to the moon without the Germans? And the answer is yes. The question is, of course, maybe a little bit later um, uh, and maybe, you know, and not in the same way. So it clearly would have changed history. Um, but um we have to keep in mind, and this is not only a good thing, but also a bad thing, that this was done very much in the context of the rising Cold War. And so what uh, Eric had mentioned was originally a temporary program or a temporary exploitation program come for six months or a year, turned into a permanent immigration program. And, 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 and that happened in the context of growing fear of the Soviet Union, growing fear of, a, of an arms race with the Soviet Union. And of course, this growing um, anti-communist hysteria of the late 40s and the early 50s certainly made it a lot easier for the military agencies to whitewash the records, or at least in, internally, they weren't whitewashed, they were essentially uh, made secret, even though the program was no longer secret, the records of these people were secret and said, let's keep this stuff secret and let's take who we need to take. And so it became easier and easier as anti-communist uh, concern or hysteria grew to say, oh, we can take this guy with an SS membership uh, like Von Braun. Um, uh, and, and, and then it had been at two years earlier in like in 1946. So it was a shifting terrain that changed the nature of the program and how fast we went from World War II into a global Cold War with the Soviet Union had a lot to do with how this program shifted to being a permanent immigration program. Okay, thank you. All right, let's uh, go into a little bit more about the whitewashing of uh, the Nazi connections by the German immigrants. So, um, Specifically, what was known about their backgrounds, um, and be specific as the names of high-profile Nazis such as Arthur Rudolph, Rudolph and the crimes he committed in Germany. Um, so, what was known about uh, their relationships, and or was some of this known later in time, decades later? There are some of the things that I read about. We'll start with Michael here. Well. Um... One of the one of the things that the U.S. was able to tell all the applicants to uh, was that 
Well, we had captured a lot of the records of the of the Nazi Party, the SS, and so forth. So you can't lie about your memberships. And so in these applications or forms that they had to fill out, you know, before and some and some after they got here, they tended to be accurate on their what membership in what organization. Uh, you know, of course, the Nazi Party movement is bigger than just the party. It's there's the SS, there's the SA or Brown Church. There are also many minor organizations uh, uh, that people were that belonged to. So memberships in organizations was pretty accurately reported uh, by the paperclip scientists and engineers. However, it's a different matter when it comes to what went on in the Third Reich, particularly regarding concentration camp labor. And I guess, and also, as we mentioned, the case of the sort of uh, prisoner experiments, um, you know, our knowledge was quite imperfect at the time. And a, lo a lot of what has been written about is revolves around the case of von Braun and Arthur Rudolph and the, and the Middlewerk and the underground plant. There was a trial in uh, at Dachau, a U.S. Army trial at Dachau of the of Dora, this, which was the name of the, the 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 base camp next to the tunnels where the V2s and later the V1s were built. There was a trial for that. Basically, low-level capos and guards were convicted, one and 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 one or two higher SS people. But nobody, uh, you know, from the company was convicted. Nobody from the von Braun group was brought in. So. You know, our knowledge of what went on in Germany was often limited. And in some ways, of course, I think in many cases, the military organizations who wanted these Germans didn't want to know. They just assumed not know as no uh, in that kind of case, because that opens you up to a whole bunch of arguments. Whereas if somebody lied about their party membership, they could go look up their record and say, you're lying about this. That's a problem. Um, I, I think that's. I, I think that's that's an important point that that Michael mm -hmm. made that the the military didn't want to know. Uh, they certainly mm -hmm. weren't probing to find out what these guys had done, and that that effort would not come until the early 1980s when the Justice Department belatedly created a Nazi hunting unit, and the the, the sole person from Operation Paperclip who was. Um, prosecuted, although he didn't end up being convicted, was Arthur Rudolph. Uh, we let him uh, just sort of leave on his own and go back to Germany. He, left, he lived out his life in Hamburg. Uh, he was not prosecuted. He was not formally deported because there was such pushback even within the United States from the White House to the Justice Department nosing around with his Nazi scientists. So you asked, though, what like specifics, what did these guys do? So Arthur Rudolph and Werner von Braun are, are, are the best examples of the, the slave labor atrocities. At, at Dora Middlewerk, this was a horrible, horrible place where tens of thousands of, of workers, most of them uh, POWs, so, some Jews, but not the majority. The majority were French POWs, Polish POWs um, uh, across the board. Uh, were literally worked to death in building the V2s, horrible disease, typhus, um, uh, exhaustion, um, dying of exhaustion. And in the worst cases, uh, if the workers were suspected of somehow tampering with the assembly lines in building the V2, they would gather them a few dozen times over those couple of years uh, to the center of the, the, the underground factory by a crane, and they would hang them while everyone else gathered around to watch as, as a lesson. So Arthur Rudolph was the hands-on man. He was the man in charge of production uh, for, the, uh, for the scientific branch, and he worked hand-in-hand -hand with the SS um, that, that did the, the uh, security at the, at the underground plant. So they, they were on a timetable uh, straight, straight from Hitler, who was directly involved in this, in terms of how many V2 rockets they needed to produce, how many men they needed to produce those, and they knew how many men would die in, in producing those. Um, and von Braun, um, you know, visited the Dora Middlewerk. Uh, he was certainly well aware of what was going on there. Um, he was asked, did he ever see any dead people? Uh, he said, and he said, sort of, sort of nonchalantly, no, you know, I knew there were people dying, but no, I didn't see it. Uh, but he, he visited there probably a dozen times over those couple of years. He was well aware of what was going on there. He was even brought back to Germany years later to, uh, I'm sorry, he wasn't physically brought back, but they let him testify from Florida. To, to be deposed in a war crimes case. So uh, the, the two of them, and there were many under them who also came to the US were 
you know, certainly aware of, and in, in Rudolph's case, directly involved in these wartime atrocities. And then but the, if, I, the, the if I can add to this, yes, about, sure. about the knowledge of the time. So the question was about the knowledge of the time. At the time, the mentality largely was in the military, in the United States, even, you know, large spread in the society was science and engineers were opportunists. And the Nazis were the people responsible for crimes. And so there was this automatic tendency to assume that the technical personnel were not responsible for the crimes. And so it was all, and it was all too easy, of course, for those who had come over, the Germans had come over, to go along with that assumption that, you know, there are bad Nazis, usually SS, who are the people committing crimes. And these guys were just a bunch of opportunists who joined the party out of convenience. Um, so, you know, in fact, there was no deep attempt to understand the middle Baudora story at all. Uh, and it tended to exist in different places. So there was a war crimes investigation in Germany that lit, was led to that trial that I mentioned. And there was a Germans who came to the US for technical purposes like transferring knowledge of rocketry. And, you know, those two barely touched. There was one, one war crimes investigator who came to El Paso to ask questions about that. And of course, the Germans were very careful in what they said about that. Um, so, you know, a lot of what we know about Middle Baudora is really a product of the publishing of the Rudolph case in 1984 and all of the investigative journalism and scholarship that followed that. And uh, little, much less was known in 1947 because, as I mentioned and we said, you know, sometimes the military would just assume not know. Uh, what I, th I think it's also important just to come around to that point that that the, the military not only didn't didn't want to know as as we've both said but but um, put this 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 uh, shiny veneer on um, on the men and a few women that that were involved in the Nazi uh, space pro uh, military program um, and the program became public very quickly within I think six months or a year. Uh, the, the, the War Department had to acknowledge that this that they were bringing at that point hundreds of uh, Nazi engineers and scientists and even just bureaucrats. Some of them were just administrators. They weren't even all scientific types. Um, and they did a, a really wondrous PR job of, of making them out to be heroes who had no one. They, they actively said they had no involvement in Nazi atrocities, which in, in a number of these instances clearly was not true. Um, and they even put them on a postage stamp, uh, and they had, uh, you know, photo ops. Where in, in there was one in Texas where reporters would be invited out um, to see some of the wives coming to meet their husbands in Texas, and it was all very uh, a cheery and a feel-good story about these these heroes. We we built in some ways the myth of the the non-ardent Nazis who had who had come to America to help us get to the moon. Was there ever a plan to bring any of these uh, scientists or, or these Nazi participants in Operation Paperclip? Um, uh, was there ever a plan to, uh, to identify the crimes they committed and, and prosecute them? Well, that, as I alluded to earlier, came much later, beginning with the creation of this Justice Department office in 1979. Um, by that point, Werner von Braun had had passed away, I believe in 1977 around then, but Michael can correct me. But there were discussions um, at this new Justice Department office uh, in the early 1980s as they were going off uh, after our, what were they gonna do about Werner von Braun? He was a celebrity. He was, uh, he had his own Disney show. He was this Renaissance man. He played piano, scuba. He had the ear of presidents. He was, you know, just this larger than life character. And, you know, were, were they gonna, posthumously, you know, look at his record and his involvement in atrocities. And if he had been alive, would they have tried to prosecute him? There were active discussions about that at the Justice Department, which was not welcome at, at, at the White House. The, as, as I said, the only one who, who was actively investigated to the point that he had to leave the country was, was Arthur Rudolph um, in, in Texas, the doctor who led the medical aviation program. I think we might have a photo of him, Sidney, was who, who bare to struggle who um, oversaw 
uh, medical experimentation at Dachau on children, um, on, on prisoners. Uh, there was dispute. Oh, I argue with that. I mean, yeah, that, I, I know he about has a very that. indirect knowledge of that. He's not, no, not direct. He's not a direct involvement. The, the, I, mean, I want to make one point again. Yeah. This is maybe a distinction between how Eric and I approach this question. Yeah. I think 90 plus percent of the people that came under paperclip were fine because they were basically technicians and engineers who did various things who are not involved. For example, out of the whole Peinemunda group, you're talking about maybe a dozen out of uh, the 120 original ones or so 10% who were involved in the in the concentration camp labor and the other 90% weren't because they were just engineers working on guidance or rocket engines or whatever. Um, so, but you know, said, it you is said, you're, you're sure that you said ha half, half this, of them. This, you, excuse me? You, you said half of the 120 earlier, you uh, said half were, have were party active Nazi record. party members. Yeah, half of them are, well, party or SA or SS. Not all, sometimes where you get some people who are SA but not party and yada yada. About half of them are members, a lot of them are nominal members. So, uh, it's I, a question, I that, you know, it's a question of whether you want to decide that anybody who had been a party member, even if it was because of convenience for your, the career, should be denied or not. You know, that's 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 one statistic. It's, you know, there's obviously a huge gray zone here. You've got the people at the top who may have been involved in serious stuff. Uh, and sometimes the people at the bottom who just happen to be assigned to the middle very who are also involved in criminal stuff. And then you have a lot of, then you have this large middle of people who are in a gray zone. Some of them are not party members and not involved in any criminal activity and they just happen to work for the Third Reich, which for some people may be just unacceptable in itself. Um, then there are the people who may have been nominal party members, but they were just basically technical experts and hadn't been involved in anything uh, like the middle Baudora story since they were working hundreds of kilometers away in Panamunda. And there are a lot of examples like this as you go through the whole page of paperclip which I have to underline was much bigger than the Fun Brown group. Maybe 80% of the paperclip intake was not related to the Fun Brown group. And they went to the Air Force, they went to the Navy, they went to aerospace industry, they went everywhere. And they mostly dis dispersed into these different agencies and industry locations and academia and disappeared because they just became immigrants uh, in the United States. So. You know, again, that's my caution against the global depiction of everybody who came under paperclip and the, with the same brush. Um, okay. Anything to add to that, Eric? Uh, well, I, I think the point that, that that they were literally all over the country is is an important one. I mean, they they were in Alabama, they were in Texas, they were in San Diego, they were in Ohio, I, I, and. Part of the, the military's effort was to really indoctrinate them into American society, even though initially this, as we said, was supposed to be a temporary thing. Um, the military made very clear in various memos and letters that, you know, once they came here, they would be treated as Americans and, and they were welcomed with, with open arms. Um, you know, and, and we could go off on a separate subject, but the the um, the the horrible irony that um, a lot of Holocaust survivors were not able to get into the country, um, hundreds of thousands of them for Eastern Europe who were uh, held in displaced persons camps for as long as three or four years. Um, those people were living often in in horrific conditions even after surviving the Holocaust, and yet here we were um, accepting uh, as many as sixteen hundred. Nazi scientists with open arms and and doing everything we could to make their lives as comfortable as possible. Um, so that that's a whole another tangent, which is really painful. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I don't know if there's anything else to say about Werner von Braun, but um, he's probably, uh, as we said, the most well known of these uh, immigrants and the most instrumental in developing the Saturn V rocket that took the United States to the moon. Um, he was head of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, all done as an ex-Nazi Nazi and a SS officer. What are your thoughts about his rise to power? Um, and uh, were there neg do you consider there to be negative after effects of, this, of his um, 
rise to power in NASA in his overlooking of the uh, overseeing of the moon program. So what can we say when we look back and we look at Werner von Braun and, and now that we have all of this information, we look back, what can we learn from it? Michael wrote the book on Werner von Braun, literally, so I'll, I'll let him start. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, here again, I guess probably Eric and I are not on exactly the same page, which might be actually useful for everyone to see that there's not one point of view about this. I, you know, in my biography, I tried to steer between the poles of hero worship and demonization, which is the way everybody wrote, writes about von Brown. Either he's a bad Nazi criminal or he's our great space hero. And, um, and and try to see him for what I thought he was. Anyway, my point of view on him was that um, he was not an enthusiastic Nazi. He joined the party out of uh, uh, because he was told he had to. He joined the SS because he was told it would be politically inconvenient if he didn't. Uh, he went along kind of and, um, uh, you know, as one reviewer of my biography said, they, we, I caught von Braun in one morally supine movement, uh, you know, moment after another, where he basically, you know, avoided responsibility or went along because it was good for his career. So, I mean, the, the longtime accusation about him was he was nothing but a careerist, but I think he was passionate about going into space. He was passionate about space travel, but he was also passionate about being a German nationalist. And then in the United States, he became passionate about being an American nationalist and was happy to build weapons for Nazi Germany. And then he was happy to build weapons for the United States. So, you know, there was certainly something opportunistic about him at the same time as there was something, uh, you know, deeply ingrained in his interest in spaceflight. Um, but he didn't come for the United States to go to the moon. He didn't come for a space program. He came to help the United States acquire missile technology. And that's basically what he did for the first 15 years of his career in the United States. He worked for the U.S. Army, not NASA. And uh, he built uh, or he organized the development of missiles, including two nuclear arm missiles, the Redstone and the Jupiter, in the 1950s. So, you know, he made this substantive contribution to the U.S., nuclear weapons capability in the 50s. And then he went on to NASA when his Huntsville group was transferred by Eisenhower from the Army to NASA. Um, so, you know, I see him as someone who be, sleepwalked into a Faustian bargain with the Third Reich. Uh, he, uh, he had in some ways was blind to the crimes of the regime, was loyal to Hitler, uh, as were so many Germans believing in the mythology. Uh, and then he became disillusioned in my analysis in the late, in the middle war, uh, first because uh, he encountered concentration camp labor, then because he was arrested by the Gestapo in uh, March, 1944 and held for some remarks that he'd made at a party when he drank too much about Ronnie to go into space and building weapons and Germany was gonna lose the war. So there's evidence of von Braun's disillusionment and uh, growing alienation from the Third Reich late in the war. However, it did not stop him from working hard on building the missile V-2 missile. Uh, it did not get him off the hook for having been more involved in concentration camp labor. Um, you know, that was, that became his Faustian bargain to go along, get along and, and build the rockets he wanted to build. He had to accept the price of, you know, going along with the party and the SS and then going along with the use of concentration camp labor, even though it wasn't his idea. So, you know, he had to live with that after the war. But the United States, as Eric has described, as we've talked about, made it easy because, you know, we sort of pushed that stuff under the rug and said, you know, we need him. He's wonderful for us. And for a law for about 20 to 30 years, he essentially got away without having to really honestly grapple with his guilt and responsibility for his role in the middle there. Um, and the SS membership didn't really come out until 69 and for the most part, not until 1984. And I know Eric has some slightly different opinions point of view. I, 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 you know what, I, I actually ag agree with most of that. I ha hate to um, take the thunder out of the debate, but but uh, no, I, I, you use the word an opportunist. I, I think that he was 
a brilliant scientist who was an opportunist um, who willing to uh, accept financing from anyone that would provide it to help him build his missiles. Um, and he, he was- did he, observe, he did observe the slave labor though. He, he did, he was very, he, he was certainly aware of it, yes, uh, of what was going on at, at, at first at Pinamunda and then, and then at Dora, um, horrible, horrible atrocities. Uh, he, he talked a bit about it um, a few years after the war, uh, I believe in the early 50s, he did a long, long interview with The New Yorker where he was sort of, I'd say callous and completely indifferent to the atrocities that he saw. I mean, he was basically, this was a transactional view of science. Um, whoever would provide him the money and structure and manpower to build better missiles, he was willing to go along with that. And the morality was just immaterial to him, it seemed like. Um, so I, I, I think that, that the fact that we... Yeah. I don't totally, I, I don't completely agree with that. I mean, I think he understood that once the concentration camp labor was turning bad, that he was involved in something that he did not like, did not want to have, but he was involved in that system. So he is morally responsible for taking actions in relationship to the administration of slave labor. I don't think he liked it or thought it was, I don't think he was morally totally indifferent, but he always ended up making the choice that was good for him you know, and, and then not taking responsibility for it. Uh, he, he had a very hard time accepting any responsibility for the, when the 60s came along and this growing chorus of French concentration camp survivors from Dora started speaking out and others, you know, he was starting to be pressed to respond somehow. Yeah. But always it seemed to be about, I thought that was bad. I didn't like it. Uh, but never really said, I take responsibility for any of it. Uh, he always seemed to evade res personal responsibility. All right, let's move on to, um, we have uh, some questions from the audience. Um, first one is, while the Germans were not necessarily more technically advanced than other countries, what was the relative status of the U.S. in comparison? Um, I think, you know, I mean, it varies by area. And I made that specific point early on because there is still a very entrenched thing, which you see, like, for example, on History Channel documentaries or whatever, of the Germans being technologically superior to the Allies at the end of the war. It depends on the technology. So in the case of rockets, very clearly, the, the Germans spent a huge amount of money on the ballistic missile that we didn't, and we made the right choice there because it turned out to be a huge waste of money for the Nazis. Uh, and jet engines and jet aircraft, there was a rough parity and radar. In some ways, the US was superior. In atomic weapons, obviously, we were way ahead of everybody else, uh, uh, and, and the Germans had failed. Um, and submarines, there were some things that were better about the uh, Nazi submarine technology than what we had. So, you know, there was a, a sort of a, you know, a smorgasbord of things in which they were at least competitive, which case still makes it interesting. And then uh, some, a, a few places were, um, and they were superior to us. Um, it made World War, the end of World War II, completely unique in any war before or since, because in past wars, there would be plunder or they'd be taking a treasure or they'd be taking a whatever. But this was the all really the only war in which everybody said this is there's a huge scientific technological haul to be gotten out of the collapse of the Third Reich. And there's then a gold rush to get grab onto that. And there's a huge export of knowledge, people, documents, everything, machinery, you know, in all directions, notably the four, four great powers at the end of the war, um, uh, all wanted a piece of that. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the U.S. clearly wanted uh, the, the technology that von Braun had developed for the V-2 uh, missiles in terms of jet propulsion, especially where, where they were, were, you know, steps ahead of the United States. Um, and, and also hand in hand with that was the, the, the medical aviation piece of that, that these doctors in Texas led by Uberta Strughold, um, who I think we have a photo of, uh, had, had been working on with Von Braun. There were over 30 doctors, if I remember right, who were brought to Texas as part of Strughold's uh, team. And uh, his, his task in Germany, yeah, there you see him uh, in Texas in this flight simulator, which became sort of a, 
a a a, uh, a a VIP stop. LBJ went there when he was still a still a senator uh, to see how how man how how astronauts could survive in space, even even if we could put them up there with von Braun's rockets. Um, Strughold was the man responsible for. Uh, making sure that they could stay alive. And that's what he had done also in different contexts in Germany. He literally wrote, wrote the book um, in the United States on medical aviation. What's interesting there is that he took out um, and did not include uh, all the references to where that material came from, which was uh, part of it was these human experiments at Dachau in, in a similar simulator as this that they used in Germany, they would put children in that. Now we can we can debate and, and, and perhaps differ on what what exactly was Strokehold's knowledge of that. There there was, I think, substantial evidence that he knew what was going on. He was in meetings at high levels about uh, 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 about tasking more exper human experiments be done um, for the sake of saving, for instance, uh, Luftwaffe pilots who crashed in the ocean and were dying from saltwater intake. They then uh, on the prisoners and sometimes kids to to uh, to see what would keep them alive and what would kill them. And in some cases, they died. Um, so he was certainly overseeing this. And some of the doctors uh, who ended up in Texas were the ones uh, I mentioned. Three of them were actually tried at Nuremberg, um, who were directly involved in these experiments. All right, if you know, what was the working relationship like between American scientists, technicians, engineers, and the Germans? Were the Germans isolated? Well, were, I mean, I, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think the basic answer is there's all kinds of, again, because this is a national phenomenon, because this is not just about the Fun Brown Group, there's a huge variation in that. A lot of them end up, as I said, in uh, not as a coherent group like von Braun's group did. They end up as individual scientists and engineers who uh, were in Air Force uh, labs. They were in industry. Um, you know, I think just to try to make a generalization, in, there was a lot of there was certainly suspicion and resentment among some people. You know, depending on your background, you know, maybe your your parents were Polish or. Czech or you know you were Jewish or something else or a lot of reasons for some people to really suspect the Germans so they weren't greeted with open arms by everybody but the Cold War made it so much easier to rationalize this we need these guys they're helping us they're being transferred they're being integrated into you know they're being immigrated into the country and made into Americans uh, so uh, you know they're useful to us we'll go along with it um, so I think you see a whole range from enthusiasm to, to suspicion, depending on who you're talking about and where. Yeah, I, I agree that there was a real mix depending on where and who you're talking about. There, there were mm -hmm. in, in Alabama where many of the uh, von, von Braun's people ended up, you know, there were sort of disparaging references to Kraut Hill, which is where a bunch of them lived. And, and you, there were stories that came out in the in the 50s of, of American scientists getting in trouble for for talking about the damn Nazis, and and that was frowned upon by the by the senior people who wanted them indoctrinated as as their own people. They didn't want any distinction between German scientists and American scientists. Um, but then you see whatever friction existed at some levels. You know, von Braun obviously was feted, you know, from 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 Washington to the White House to 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 Hollywood, um, and the fact that he was German was sort of almost almost forgotten by later in life by the time that he. Uh, you know, was involved in the lunar lunar landing. Okay. Um, next question: Did we prioritize those that were living in Soviet-occupied zones, given the risk they would be taken by the Soviets much more easily? Well, I mean, um, I think uh, not really. But there was an except at the very beginning. At the very beginning. When the U.S. Uh, Army over, rolled over the Middleberg, uh, Middlebadora, in April '45 in Buchenwald, we were on uh, territory that was had to be given up to the Soviet Union. So, under the agreed line of demarcation between occupation zones, we overran an area that was going to become the Soviet zone of occupation. And so, there was a significant Army 
uh, effort to evacuate the particularly the von Braun group people and some others out of the zone that was going to become Soviet. So there were some people right at the end of the war, before the war was even over, before there was any Cold War, who were definitely uh, anti-Soviet who wanted to get people out of there. Um, but you know, once the uh, demarcation line exists, once the occupation zones were set, there was some attempt on both sides for Soviets to lure uh, people, science engineers in the West to go to the Eastern zone and vice versa. Uh, there was certainly a certain amount of covert uh, intelligence re agency related attempts to smuggle people in and out. Uh, you know, there were at least Soviet intelligence contemplated kidnapping von Braun and some others. Uh, so there was a certain amount of cloak and dagger stuff going on there. Um, but, you know, the question is a good one because it brings us back to something we said earlier, which was keeping these people away from the Soviets became a ma major motivation for paper clip. You know, especially as the Cold War got worse, it became easier and easier to say, we got to keep them away from even going back to the Western zone of Germany, because we don't know that they won't end up in East Germany or the Soviet Union. So, you know, the what became called the denial value, you know, keeping them out of the hands of the Soviet bloc became a significant motivation. And it was among some people in the military that was there from day one. You know, keep it, keep these people out of Soviet hands. Maybe they're useful to us, but they, you know, we don't want them to be useful to Soviets. Okay. Yeah, there were there was almost a, a bidding war for for some of the the top scientists and, and and engineers to entice them with with mm -hmm. you know, promises of everything that would await them in in the United States in terms of homes and finances and security, uh, a better life than than the Russians could could offer them. And, and the other piece of this, completely separate from. From the scientists, um, but related to the Cold War, was that we also simultaneously were were trying to get as many of the the top German uh, spies as as we could, who the, the CIA, which was formed a few years later, um, you know, signed on as American spies, and they had been involved, uh, you know, in in all sorts of atrocities themselves. That that wasn't the, the the science program, but that was the intelligence piece of this, where there was many, there were as many as a thousand um, uh, former uh, SS, SA, ver various German spies. Um, Klaus Barbie became one of the the, the most infamous ones years later, uh, who we were very willing to to bring into the fold as as American spies, because the thinking was that no one hated the Russians uh, more than the Germans, and they had. Uh, valuable intelligence, similar to the valuable scientific intelligence that the scientists had, uh, that we could exploit. Um, a lot of times that proved to be uh, completely fictional, and really they just bamboozled us um, and, and, and got out of legitimate war crimes prosecutions in the process. Yeah, I mean, I, I would underline that, and that's in Eric's book, that, you know, it's a lot of this is an outside paperclip, but it's a parallel phenomenon of this uh, taking in former Nazi, a lot of them were Germans. There was a huge uh, taking in of uh, uh, collaborators, collaborators from yeah. like the Baltic states and Ukraine and other places who had been, uh, you know, uh, open collaborators in the Holocaust and and in saying we need these people and allowing them to come in or not vetting them very well and not really caring very deeply whether they've been involved in something. So, yeah, I think the worst scandals are relating to the intelligence agencies and who they covered up and brought in or 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 used in Germany. So, for example, the whole the whole SS intelligence division devoted to the Soviet Union effectively became the core of the West German intelligence agency, right. the, the Bundesnachrichten Dienst. Right, this is an interesting question, certainly to me as an educator. It says, how do each of you believe this history should be taught and remembered? Should we still have a center named after von Braun? Uh, you know, I've been asking people to stop to consider unnaming uh, uh, and Huntsville is pretty much, un you can't move that place at least at this time. Uh, but uh, yeah, it bothers me that there is a von Braun Civic Center, or there's a Fun Brown building this and Fun Brown Center for that in Huntsville. Uh, it's not everybody in Huntsville because I gave lectures at the university and there are people the university supported. 
open discussion of Middle Bodora, but the city as a whole. I don't want to make just a Huntsville story, but it is very much that town, which I know well and enjoyed visiting many times, is too tied to the idea that Thun Brown is the creator of modern Huntsville uh, to honestly deal with the Nazi question. Well, and, and Dr. Storkold in Texas, um, he had his defenders for years and years, and, and there were several awards um, and a library named after him, uh, the top medical aviation award um, and, and a library in San Antonio, I believe. And they finally took his name down in the last, mm -hmm. uh, oh, probably 10 to 15 years after some of the pushback. Now, he clearly did not have quite the adulation of Werner von Braun. Werner von Braun, there's just this incredible mystique, as, as Michael says, especially in Alabama, but but even more broadly that, that grew up around him. Um, Struggle didn't have that. Uh, so yeah, it, as far as education, I, I think you gotta you, you gotta include the good with the bad. And and um, uh, yes, there was certainly progress that was made that might not have been made otherwise, but at, at what moral, moral cost? Um, I think that's the central question. You know, and I think on the education side, we need to always teach people with documents and with information and allow them to debate because, you know, as we've sort of revealed in this discussion, there are moral complexities here and should we have, not everybody's going to have the same answer, but we need to deal with the full slate of the knowledge and the information and that's phased not just, and not particularly on this question right now, but we see the movement all over the United States right now to suppress history that makes people uncomfortable, you know, whether it be race or something else. And we can't deal with history honestly if we're, you know, suppressing discussion of it or leaving stuff out. You know, things are going to, there are scandals and problems in, in, in the past, including in this, in this story and our best education is done by openly talking about it and having a full slate of information that, that's available to every every student and every person. Any final thoughts, Eric? Uh, no, I, I think it's you know it's a critical topic and it's it's a piece of history that hasn't gotten as much attention as as it um, as it deserves and and often what people. Uh, are aware of has been glossed over intentionally, um, you know, by, by the military. I think it's important to get the, the, the full story out there. All right. Well, thank you both for a fascinating discussion. And uh, I, I know everybody's enjoyed it. I, hear, I see some uh, lots of positive uh, comments on the chat. So thank you so much.